Okay, so uh, to start off, um, we wanted to examine the modulatory effects of inhibition on persistent activity in a toy cortical microcircuit model. Um, and the model we chose um, was by Konstan Tadaki et al., which was published in 2014. And first, before we get into that model, um, I want to go through the criteria and motivation. Um, so we realized after going over our common interest and what we wanted to focus on, um, we wanted to um, kind of have a playground to explore the effects of different modes of inhibition on circuit circuit activity. Um, and specifically, we wanted to get into the mechanisms behind uh, dampening a uh, hyper excitatory circuit. Um, and even more specific, really um, kind of figure out the balance of excitatory and inhibitory neurons. Um, and since we did have such a short amount of time with just a week, um, we did want to be able to uh, practice going through the process of converting a model in NetPine, um, mostly from neuron. Um, and when we were going through model DB, there was a lot to choose from. And we wanted to narrow down our options by uh, choosing a model that was uh, small enough computationally. So we wouldn't have to worry about once we got the model up and running, um, the simulations taking um, a significant amount of time. And um, another criteria we had to narrow down um, our options was um, we wanted to pick a model so that we could focus on biologically realistic connectivity and electrophysiology rather than um, making sure that the morphology and the whole structure of the network was um, exact. Um, and so the criteria led us to, um, oh, sorry. So first, <laughs> well, I was, oh, wait, I was, yeah, sorry, Sydney. <laughs> so great. Um, just to give, so, I mean, the, why, why would we care about like modulating inhibition in this toy circuit? So there's the, this sort of popular uh, sort of hypothesis or lens through which to see that's like become increasingly attractive over the last like 20 years about how to see some of these neurodevelopmental disorders that are super common. So uh, epilepsy, autism, schizophrenia, um, as this idea that they, they, they might, they all share a lot of genetic underpinnings. So they have quite, they have share similar genes that might be involved in these diseases, but then they present very differently. So the idea is that whether, um, they might be somehow the genetic etiology might be linked somehow by a uh, circuit level phenotype in the balance of excitation inhibition. Uh, and this can go on over multiple different time scales um, through development and it can uh, be affected by various homeostatic mechanisms, whatever. So the um, what I and a lot of so a lot of the because like the clinical trials using drugs that um, act on inhibitory receptors, inhibitory receptors. And I, a lot of our work is about creating new interneurons in the brain and how that impact that would have on circuit dynamics in like epilepsy, whether we could suppress hyperexcitable circuits. So there are tons of different ways that you can increase inhibition in the network. And that was kind of like our starting point. So you can add and remove whole neurons. So remove excitatory neurons or add inhibitory neurons. And there are different types of inhibitory neurons. You can increase the number of connections. You can increase the number of synapses, the synaptic weights, or other dynamics of the um, synapses uh, and GABAergic transmission. And then you can also, I mean, you could go on forever about different ways you could think up to affect inhibition. So we were going. The idea is to try to use our toy circuit as a way to play around with inhibition in the circuit to see whether there are any qualitative effects on the dynamics. Okay, so um, with all of this in mind, um, this led us to finding the constant Tadaki model. Um, and from their abstract, they said how uh, they wanted to have a computational approach to study how changes in the excitation and inhibition balance in a prefrontal cortex microcircuit model affect the properties of persistent activity. Um, and persistent activity is the firing um, that persist after the triggering stimulus disappears. Um, and on the right is um, a schematic of the physical connections. And this is from uh, the paper. 
Um, and as you can see, the model consists of pyramidal neurons and three different types of interneurons, specifically fast spiking, regular spiking, and irregular spiking. Um, and these connections were through uh, the excitatory synapses AMPA and NMDA and the inhibitory synapses GABA-A and GABA-B. Um, and GABA-B does have 100 times faster binding and unbinding rate. Um, and to simulate the thalamocortical stimulus coming into the network, um, they have a brief, uh, a brief uh, stimulus for only 500 milliseconds. Um, and this original model um, was constructed in Neuron, which was also very attractive for us for choosing this because it made it a lot easier to import the cell types and the synaptic mechanisms. Okay, so this is um, some finer detail of the structure and connectivity of the model. Um, on the right are um, this was created with the NetPine GUI um, to show all the different um, types of cells, the pyramidal fast spiking, regular spiking, and irregular spiking. Um, and uh, the table shows the details of the connections with the synaptic mechanisms and the number of synapses per connection. Um, but I do want to focus on the graph on the bottom, which shows, um, has a, it's a good graph of the connections between all the neurons. So there's recurrent connections um, with the pyramidal and the fast spiking neurons um, and bilateral connections um, to the pyramidal neurons from all of the uh, interneurons. And just a singular connection going from the irregular spiking to the regular spiking. And these were constructed using um, realistic weights and um, it is also interesting that there's no convergence or divergence um, or any probabilistic uh, connectivity um, between these neurons. Uh, it's all connected with 100% probability. So all of the 16 pyramidal neurons connect to the other 16 or the other 15 pyramidal neurons. And going through this um, as with constructing a model or um, doing like hypothesis testing or any experiments, there's gonna come up with issues. Um, and the main one we ran into, um, as you can see in the voltage traces, was that the fast spiking and the regular spiking um, interneurons uh, fired on their own spon spontaneously without any um, stimulus. And we found this by looking at the um, Hawk and mod files um, from the version that is on model DB. Some of the parameters did not match um, what the parameters that were published in the paper. Um, specifically, the SOMA resting potential um, for the interneurons was set to zero, um, which um, on their own caused them to fire spontaneously. Um, and another gap. Uh, between the models was that there wasn't any feedback from other cortical areas. Um, they just used the thalamocortical um, stimulus. So it is a very um, isolated and doesn't properly reflect how all the different inputs coming into um, the cortex. Um, and another thing was that like our NetPine implementation lacks autopsies, um, specifically um, which is the connection from a pyramidal neuron onto itself. Um, we had some issues trying to get that working in NetPine, and we decided um, that we were able with um, we were able to get the behavior that we wanted to focus on without those. Right. <clears throat> so uh, having so we had all those problems with the with the errors in the Hawk file. So I my. We, at this point, we'd already constructed the whole network, uh, thinking that this is going to work fine out of the box. So we put all of our neurons in, and then we got this spontaneous spiking. We realized something was wrong. So I ended up going back and just validating the electrophysiology of all of the cells, which is obviously a big learning point for us to do this first. But anyway, it was eventually done. So this is just the current clamp protocol. So I just increased increasing in steps of um, 
20 pico amps uh i for a duration of about 800 milliseconds um i increased in steps and looked at the firing rates of firing response of each of our neurons so this is just an example of the current set protocol um and i'll show you some data from empirical data and from the paper from where we derived where we got the original model from so this was our excitatory parameter neuron which at um 8.8.18 nanoamps gave us a few spikes um and that was relatively similar in sort of to the what they saw what they said they got in when they did this in the paper so they got at 0.15 nanoamps they got these two spikes um so i mean i wasn't that i was sort of relatively happy it wasn't exactly what they said they got in the paper but it was relatively close enough so I was sort of more or less happy with the parameters on neurons um and similarly for the regular spiking into neurons so at the, the after correcting the parameters as best i could um to make them like they said they were in the paper i got some regular spiking and um in response to uh, 0.05 nano amps and in the paper they say they got 16 spikes when they did this and i only get nine but again it was regular and i got some spiking activity and it looks more or less okay so that's where we were um then the fast spiking into neurons were a bit yeah, I just they just didn't behave the way that the paper said they were going to behave at all, and I we couldn't figure it out. But I mean, at, at 0.2 nano amps, I get a nice hundred hertz regular um, firing of the of their FS into neurons, but at the sort of the threshold frequency at 0.05 nano amps, they got this stuttering behavior in their neurons, which I just didn't see at all. Um, and then sort of even more frustrating was the uh, and the less in keeping with what they said they got in the paper were the irregular spiking into neurons which their whole feature should be that they fire regularly but to me they behaved they were like completely irregular um uh, so all this just to say that the we tried our best to model you know to we thought we would get we would picked an easy task here to take these neurons and put them into NetPile and the whole point of using them was that this was that going to be out of the box but of course it didn't necessarily work for us um but anyway we persevered with our with our model and the quits behavior so I'll hand you back to Kate to talk you through what the network behaved like at first okay so yeah once we got the parameters tuned a bit more um and the cells had been validated um so we started to compare like the baseline behavior of the model to what was in the paper. Um, and before that, I do want to give um, a like overall idea and view of um, what's going on uh, with the persistent activity. And so on the right is a raster plot. Um, and this shows all of the uh, 20 different cells. Um, and as you can see, like with the irregularity, the on the bottom two, the regular spiking and irregular spiking are kind of synchronized when they really shouldn't be. Um, and then on the left, the connection just shows um, as you, like as I mentioned before, we do not have the autopsies and um, cells linked to themselves. So. Um, here is uh, the voltage traces um, of the persistent activity. Um, so on the left is um, from the paper and on the right is from uh, NetPine. Um, and as you can see on the left, there are a lot more gaps um, between some of the spiking, uh, specifically in the irregular, um, and even more so from, and still some in the pyramidal. Um, and as you can see in our run, there aren't really any gaps. There are a couple, but not to the same uh, degree as what they saw in the paper. And to really drive home the point of that the NetPlane model really does lack the irregularity. Um, so on the right is from output from NetPlane. And as you can see that the irregular spiking actually is the most regular um, and the fast spiking is the most irregular. Um, and in contrast to uh, the graph on the left from the paper, um, it's the opposite. So as you would expect, 
the irregular is the most irregular and the fast spiking is the least. Okay, so um, then now, so we, we have this initial model, it's not perfect, it's it's messy, it's, you know, it doesn't behave how we thought it was gonna behave, but we have a model, it does this, it's got so, it's highly recurrent, it's highly excitable. So we thought we'd play around with different modes of inhibition. So this is just a schema of what we did, the like different um, little miniature in silico experiments we did. So we had the network, the baseline network behavior, which we just showed you, and then we did, uh, we played around with the uh, weights of the inhibitory um, synapses. So both GABA A and GABA B, we turned up the gain on both of those different synapses across the network. We also increased the number of fast spiking into neurons, um, both just by increasing the population size, but also with variable connectivity rules to see what impact that would have on network dynamics. We also added additional connections, which I think Kate will talk to you about later. Um, so I'll just quickly show, I mean, so we the first thing we did was just turn up the in, the inhibition in the network to see to try to dampen down this the like recurrence and the hyperactivity, and so as you might expect, so if you um, increase the synaptic weight on the GABA A, which is an ionotropic receptor, you slow down the rate of the network. It starts to look a bit um, it, it spikes. The whole network activity reduces in the rate of firing, but it's still super regular. Um, and even at a hundred times the GABA A weight, you, it slows down more, but I mean, it's not dramatic and it's still just pounding along persistent and then regular. The GABA B are, I think Kate alluded to, I mean, they're stronger and they're slower and they have a much more profound effect on the, on the network. So even with the two times increasing the GABA ergic weight, you see an effect of it slowing down and then by three times the GABA B synaptic um, gain, it shuts off this re persistent activity after you re release the stimulus, the thalamocortical stimulus. So I mean, that was super fairly obvious. I mean, we turned up the inhibition and it shut down the network a bit. So then we decided to put in what happens if we add in some extra interneurons into our circuit. So I did this in two ways. Um, or showing you two ways. Uh, so the first way was just to add, this is an extra fast spiking into neuron and it's connected with no probabilistic connection. It's 100% connected to all of the pyramidal neurons. And they are also connected to it with 100%, like without, like in a deterministic way. And they're exactly the same in the other parameters to the normal fast spiking into neurons. And then I did exactly the same thing. I just did, it was just 50% chance of the extra far spiking into inhibitory neuron had a 50% probability of connecting to a pyramidal neuron. And I wanted to see if there was any difference in the network behavior. So I was thinking that, well, you have the same, um, they, they, they have the same presynaptic, these extra interneurons have the same presynaptic input, but this one has 50% fewer output postsynaptic connections. And because they're inhibitory, I thought if you had less inhibition, you would get a more excitable network. But obviously, <laughs> it is completely paradoxical to that. And it's kind of interesting that that happens. So these, uh, when I put the extra interneuron in, there was 100% with 100% connectivity to all of the parameter neurons. It did, it reduced in the frequency compared to the baseline condition. But then when they, that exact same interneuron is only connected to half of the parameter neurons actually is even slower than network. And that seems quite paradoxical. I still haven't explained this. Um, and it's also slightly more irregular, but I guess the irregularity makes sense because you have got half of the connection. So I can understand the irregularity aspect, but it's interesting that the rate is slower. Um, and then I thought, well, yeah, maybe this is just an artifact of the fact, well, now I've everything else is deterministic. So maybe because I've had some probability in there, I've got some weird result. So then I also just went back and I looked at what happens if I make the, in, the endogenous to the network, um, fast spiking into neurons probabilistic, and it carries on exactly as base. Like I see it essentially makes no difference to the network rate or regularity. But then, um, and that's in stark contrast to what happens if you add one more interneuron that's probabilistically connected. Um, so that was that. And then now Kate is going to talk you through adding dendritic inhibition.
I think you're on mute, Kate. I am, thank you. Um, so the original paper included um, the fast spiking neurons connecting to the pyramid neurons at the soma and at the dendrite. Um, and so the tests Sydney ran were just with those uh, soma connections. Um, and so we wanted to test when it had the dendrite connections and you would expect um, that since there's more inhibition that it would dampen the excitatory activity. Um, and it actually um, increased the firing rates. Um, so on the left is where the baseline with just the soma um, and on the right is with the soma and the connections at the proximal dendrite. Um, and comparing these two um, graphs uh, showing the rate, um, it looks like they stay about the same, um, but if you can see, yeah, the note on the x-axis scale, so all of the rates increased. Um, so the regular and irregular is around 50, 60, but with the dendrite, it's um, around 70. So we did similar tests um, with increasing the gain. Um, so this is going over with the GABA A, and this took a lot more gain um, to really show um, how it slowed down uh, the rate of the system. And so on the left is um, 100 times, um, and that did um, inhibit the regular spiking neurons enough where they just couldn't fire after the initial spike. Um, and then on the right is a, a billion times the synaptic weight. Um, and originally these weights are really small. Um, for GABA A, it's about like 0. 0.0008. Um, and that didn't even change um, the behavior that much. And so I did want to test how could we get it to stop the persistent activity. And so the weight had to be 5 billion times the um, initial weight to get that to stop. Um, and so um, as Sydney saw, the GABA B um, was able to stop the activity much faster, um, but with those dendritic connections, it was, um, uh, it still took more uh, weight um, in those connections to stop the activity. Um, so on the left is about two times, which, um, doesn't make that big of a difference, um, but to stop the persistent activity, the weight had to be increased about 10 times. Um, and to get to where there's only one spike, um, the weight had to be increased to 50 times. So that was where there was a strong enough inhibition that um, the system just couldn't fire after the initial stimulus. Um, and so we also wanted to explore the synapses uh, for each connection. Um, and so on the left shows the GABA A. And to get that similar um, uh, rate as um, or increased uh, duration between the spiking, as seen before, is that there had to be um, at least a thousand more synapses per connection. And I do want to note that this did also uh, like greatly increase the simulation runtime because there were a thousand extra synapses for five connections. Um, and so this went from like 50 seconds to five minutes. Um, and then on the right, um, it still took a good amount more than when there was just a soma connection. Um, but around when there were 137 extra um, synapses is when the persistent activity started to taper off. and. Uh, so the firing continued about 100 milliseconds after, and then when there were 140 extra is when the persistent activity stopped with the stimulus. Um, and so comparing also again, um, the number of the fast spiking cells, um, Sydney was doing just one extra and that seemed to have a big impact on stopping the persistent activity. Um, but here I had to add 31 to get it to stop. Um, and um, also showing 124 is when there was enough inhibition to only have two spikes. Um, and I found that when there were 200 uh, fast spiking cells is when there was only one spike. So it take, 
it's yeah like sydney said it's paradoxical to think when there's more inhibition um is that it takes longer and like uh stronger connections to really stop uh any firing Okay, yeah, so I mean, just to so sum up that I think <clears throat> so the next the things we haven't done to try to play around with other interneuron subtypes, um, and of course it would be nice to have an actual model of the cortex rather than this sort of toy few neurons in a circuit. But I think we we definitely learn a lot about like how these networks might behave and how paradoxical things can be as soon as you start playing with inhibition, like um, and that we aren't even playing with inhibit inhibity. You have one connection which inhibits the inhibitor, so one disinhibitory connection, but the rest is just straightforward recurrent parameter activity and inhibition, and you still get some really unexpected findings. So, I mean, I don't know what that holds for the, <laughs> when we move up to a real <laughs> realistic network. Um, and yeah, I think that's kind of it. Um, we maybe Kate, you want to just share some of our takeaways and then. Yeah, so yeah, this was a really great experience. And I think we both definitely learned a lot. Um, and I think the biggest takeaway was like getting to know the cells individually outside of the network before running the whole network um, and being confident that just like, just assuming that it'll work. Um, and I think also um, a big lesson was comparing the model files and what version is on model db to the papers um, because the paper is going to have a lot more information on their methods and also a lot more context on their results than what can be seen on model db um, and a big thing um, is that like models can always be improved or made more realistic um, and i definitely got this insight from erica is that like kind of deciding to ignore the autopsies. Like we could have spent like two or three days just focusing on that rather than um, trying to get the results and really examining uh, the behavior of the model. And that kind of just like, there's no limit to how realistic the model can be. And you kind of have to decide at what point is it good enough to answer the questions that you have. Um, and Another lesson that I found was that how just like one parameter that's off can like drastically alter the dynamics. Um, and so it's really important to double check um, the values, the variables and parameters from the resource material. Um, and I think if we had more time to work on this um, or if this became a full research project would be definitely reaching out to those that created the model just to kind of get more context um, and see what they were going for and also see if there was anything that they wanted to do but didn't get to have a chance to do so that could be incorporated. Um, and Sydney and I also have really different backgrounds. I come from a, a computer science engineering background and Sydney is more in the uh, neuroscience biology. Um, so it was really nice um, working together. Um, and it's nice blending like the different uh, is interdisciplinary uh, fields to kind of, and that, yeah, I think we both learned a lot from each other and it was a lot of fun. Oh, thank you very much. Great job, guys. Thank you, yeah. Thanks for all the help with this. <laughs> Yeah, thank you for uh, raising those points at the end about the stuff you learned. Because, yeah, a lot of that stuff uh, seems fairly obvious once you've been doing this for years, but you forget that uh, I made those same mistakes uh, starting out. So, yeah, the model errors. Always check the models themselves and check what they published in the paper because, you know, they'll be different and, and the effects can be big. Um, yeah, questions? You presented a lot of really cool stuff where you found the number of a for a parameter where something would stop spiking. Is that is that like the batch? Did you find that with the batch parameter searching stuff, or did you do that by hand? So I ended up having to do that by hand. I tried um, getting the batch working, and one day it worked fine, and the next day it stopped. Um, and I don't know if that was my system or having like MPI or like um, 
the protocol for it. Um, but thankfully, it was a lot, uh, it was nice um, since we had such a small model that the runs were only 50 seconds. Um, so I think if we had a larger one, that was like, I definitely would have invested more time to get the batch working. <laughs> Yeah, Tony, is that a common problem that I think Eric, because we had, we did, have, we struggled with the batch quite a bit. I couldn't get mine up and running. I don't know if that's uh, something that happens. Um, uh, yeah, no, it's uh, pretty standard. Uh, we're still uh, working on batch. You know, NetPine is uh, the whole thing's a work in progress, although a lot of it is real solid. Uh, but batch is sort of the bleeding edge of where we're at. And so it's not real solid yet. Several people had problems. I, I you know, honestly, I can't run it on my own machine right now. And I want to update my OS before I figure it out. Um, so, yeah, don't don't feel bad about that. I had one question. Um, with your lack of irregularity, it looked like the the model, the published model, had noise included. Did you guys consider or try to add noise at all to see if that helped? Yeah, we did, but the, we didn't replicate exactly what they did. Um, we ended up using it. Um, we I wish we would have spoken to Nikita because he's he did a really good job at his noise. Right. Model. Yeah, he did actually. Um, we did no, we did a we did a sort of botch, well, Kate can say, well. I mean, basically, we use NetStim and we use the noisy yeah. input to each individual cell, and we tried to give them different amounts of noise so that they weren't exactly synchrony synchronous noise inputs. Um, yeah, but I mean, it wasn't it wasn't the same as their. Um, yeah, in in their model, they used um, a syn clamp to get like a sinusoidal um, input current. Okay. Um, but there wasn't, there actually wasn't much neuron documentation on it. Um, and it also wasn't a net pine. So yeah, that's where we kind of kind of pulled something together. Yeah, noise is complicated because yeah, you want some of it correlated and some of it not. And it's, yeah, it's, it's not an easy thing to do, but for yeah, for small models where it's very clean and every weight is the same, you know, sometimes a little noise is what you need to sort of jitter it into a more normal sort of behavior pattern. Yeah, I'm sure that's right. <clears throat> okay, other questions?